once upon a time, there was in the West a mighty empire called the Roman Empire. And the Romans had a very interesting map of the world. It's a small, small world in which Europa, ASEAN, and Africa were closely connected with each other. And America was nowhere to be seen. Then the world became divided and has become divided until now into some 200 political units called nation states. And they are divided along the lines of territory and along the lines of sovereignty. And many of these nation states are members of a global body called the United Nations. What about the future? Can you imagine what the future world would look like? Here we have to thank the Chinese for it largely, because the future world, as I saw it the other day when I gazed my crystal ball, that the world will be connected by high-speed railway, looking something like this. You may wonder, how did this all happen? And are the Chinese really able to connect the world by high-speed railway? Well, my answer is yes. Um, to a great extent, the Chinese can do that. To support that answer, I have got a plan. And this plan of mine consists of two parts. One part is about history. And we shall try to draw lessons from the past to inform our present. And present is being my second part of my plan, to try to explore with all of you what China uh, has been doing recently and what China is likely to do in the near future in the development of high-speed rail industry. If we look at history, we don't need to look too far back because the development of high-speed railway in China uh, has been only about 10 years or so. And the Chinese did this very smartly by introducing a full set of train from countries like Japan, from Germany, from France, from Canada. And then through a process what engineers often call reverse engineering, the Chinese engineers disassemble the whole train into uh, smaller parts in a methodological manner, step by step, and then rebuild from the basics, the small parts, into a whole train. And through this process, in a simple way, the Chinese learn the skills of building a high-speed rail. But of course, one has to give credits to the Chinese engineers. They are also very smart and be able to input their own skills, the technology, into the system. To the extent that now China has the largest high-speed rail network in any single country in the world, measuring some 16,000 kilometers, which is about half the world's total. And this number, by the way, is increasing over time. So if we look at the future, the near future at least, we can examine to what extent China is involved in the global market of high-speed rail industry. And that is something astonishing. It's a wobbling 34%. And that percentage is increasing over time as well, as estimated by uh, scholars and specialists. OK, what China is doing at present and into the near future is also of interest, because China is negotiating with some 20 to 30 countries around the world in order to build um, systems of high-speed rails in countries in Asia, in Africa, in Latin America, and beyond. 
Let me give you a few examples. In Asia first, China has a plan to build a high-speed rail system from the Chinese city of Kunming in southwest China to connect with Vientian of Laos and then all the way down to connect with Bangkok and Kuala Lumpur to the southern tip of the Malaysian peninsula, Singapore. Another line is from Kunming in China to Hanoi of Vietnam, and then along the coastline of Vietnam to Ho Chi Minh City, and then turn west to connect up with Cambodia, Phnom Penh, and then Bangkok again, and then to Myanmar and onwards. And eventually, this Pan-Asian network is going to be connected with the Eurasian network through China. And Africa is also an interesting, interesting example. The Chinese government, um, in fact, is Premier Li Jiaqiang, last year announced that China will connect all the 54 capitals of Africa by high-speed rail eventually. And here I'll give you one example of a line connecting um, Addis Ababa, the capital of Ethiopia, to Djibouti. Djibouti is very interesting because it's of great strategic importance, because it's situated at the mouth of the Red Sea, connecting to the Gulf of Aden, and then onwards to the Arabian Sea. And there are proposals to try to build um, a bridge over the stretch of land between the Arab world, which is South Yemen here, to connect with East Africa. If that bridge is built, or if that sea tunnel is built, so that a high-speed rail can go through, then East Africa will be connected with the Arab world. Another interesting point of this um, line here is from Addis Ababa. There is also a proposal to build a line westwards to South Sudan, and then still westwards to Central African Republic, and then to Cameroon, to the coast facing the Atlantic Ocean. So imagine connecting the Atlantic Ocean of Cameroon all the way to the Arab world. Isn't that amazing? Another amazing story happens in Latin America. Well, this story is becoming true these days because China, Brazil, as well as Peru have signed agreements to do a feasibility studies to build a line across the continent connecting the Atlantic coast of Brazil all the way to the Pacific coast of Peru. Not only these two countries are interested in this project because it's going to boost trade, transportation, communication, people, and so on. Other neighboring countries are also very interested in this because they want to join into this line to develop economy together. So instead of what Brazil is doing currently when trading with Asia, Brazil has to go through either the Panama Canal through Central America, or it has to go by shipping through the southern tip of Latin America, and then cross the Pacific Ocean to China, to Korea, Japan, and then India. But with this line in place, then things will speed up a lot. Beyond these three continents, there is also the proposal to build the world's longest railway line in the world by high-speed system, connecting London and New York. And apart from, well, this proposal has been made by both uh, Russia and by China. And together, say for example, with Canada and agreement with the US, this line can be built. The major obstacle of this line is in fact the sea separating Siberia and Alaska. If something can be built, a sea tunnel across the Bering Strait separating 
Russia Far East, and Alaska of the USA, a distance measuring about 300 kilometers, which is a distance about, for those who know Europe, is about five times the length of the Euro Tunnel connecting Britain and France. The difficulty with this project here is the very severe punishing weather in that sort of climate. I think it calls for ingenious en engineers. I'm sure they can do it if they want to do it. So that's a huge project there. All these projects are, of course, part and parcel of the so-called New Silk Road system that President Xi Jinping announced in late 2013, consisting of two major components, one by land, the other by sea, connecting some 64 countries along the way, representing about 60% of the global population and around 30% of the global GDP, the global economy. So is that a new globalization in the making? I would argue it's likely to be, although it is likely to be slow, incremental, instead of a big shift in terms of the change of geopolitics, a point which I will go to very shortly. OK, the big question is, where's the money coming from? All these major mega projects, they are so very nice. Um, can we share the finance of this? Well, the Chinese has proposed, as you are aware, several major regional um, international banks, such as the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, such as the BRICS Bank, or call it the New Development Bank. And also the Chinese has initiated its own, which is the New Silk Road uh, Fund. And all these mechanisms uh, have a um, huge amount of money, ranging from 40 billion US dollars in the case of the Silk, Lo Silk Road uh, Fund to uh, about 100 billion US dollars in terms of the authorized capitals. And apart from these um, regional uh, initiatives, China's own state-owned banks also can help. Uh, banks such as the Export and Import Bank of China, the China Construction Bank, and the China Development Bank. And in fact, the China Development Bank has surpassed the, the World Bank in terms of extending the amount of loans. In other words, China Development, Development Bank has become the largest uh, lender of loans to the third world to build infrastructure. So here we have political will and we have some sort of uh, financial support. So what are the implications for the world? Basically, I will um, concentrate, focus on two points. One is geopolitics. There seems to be a new balance of power developing here. One in Eurasia or Central Asia, where Russia and China are competing for influence. The other is towards China's Asia-Pacific coast, is a competition or cooperation with the USA over influence in that sort of area especially in the American, facing the American so-called uh, pivot to Asia. So somehow China has to balance between its maritime security on the one hand and also the land order uh, on the other. The second point which I'd like to share with you is that of a new sort of global norm in the making uh, where these uh, interesting features, such as the focus on building infrastructure on a win-win, mutually beneficial formula by co-financing. It's not only China, but also the host countries uh, who are building these uh, networks of uh, systems of railways. And it is led by economic growth on a little or no strings attached 
uh, formula that China is uh, proposing. So all these major features, if you like, and I'm trying to think and to find an appropriate concept or a key word to capture the spirit and the essence of these various characteristics. And here, something food for thought for us. And this is the word, geo-neo-functionalism. Um, functionalism, functionalism because it is led by economic growth, it is dealing with human welfare, and it is based on the aim and the hope of building peace through incremental steps. And neo, because it is still, despite China's uh, market measures these days, is still very much a state um, managed, if not controlled, system of running uh, political economy. And geo, because it deals with geopolitics and geoeconomics. So that's a new word that I would like to share with you. And five years from now, if you were asked, where did you first hear about this rather clumsy word? Then you can say with full confidence that you heard it in a TED talk in Seoul, won't you? And secondly, I would like you to imagine the future of high-speed rail system. You are familiar with this uh, map, which I saw earlier on. Uh, let us concentrate and focus on the area around Northeast Asia. Well, eventually and hopefully, a kind of a ring road can be built, uh, connecting uh, both North and South Korea, Japan, Russia, and China through high-speed rail and over bridges and tunnels, making the East Sea or the Sea of Japan a kind of an inland lake in Northeast Asia. So, I'll share a dream with you as we have been talking about dreams. I dream of one day that we can take a high-speed rail to travel from Seoul all the way up north to Pyongyang. And with the agreement of the supreme leader, we can travel all the way to London in the far west, or to New York in the Far East. Oh yes, is New York in the Far East. How the world would have changed by then. And more than that, we don't have to take a flight, a plane, from Seoul to either Beijing or to Vladivostok in order to join the Euro Express Line, an initiative proposed by your president, Madame Park. It started in July and finished about one week ago. That's the hope that, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for sharing this hope and dream with me. Kamsa Amida.